Hi folks, welcome to Tuesday's I Write Radio podcast, video cast. And, and because I was so bad yesterday, I have with me today Stuart Lockhead. Hello there, that's just me. And Jimmy Hutton. Good afternoon, folks. And myself, Nori Stewart. Today we're going to cover the presser. Thank God there's some politics back on. Mm. Um, and we're going to have a chat about Craig Murray. Um, well, we'll wait till we get there before we tell you the detail. Um, the press conference today, Jimmy, you got a bit heated under the collar about our glorious press corps. Yeah, well, I know that some of the press corps have taken advantage and gone on holiday. I do hope that some of them have gone to Spain. <laughs> I, I their sangria is tasting a bit bitter this afternoon, but um, I think what the press conference showed today is just how poor the um, championship contenders who are looking to become top division are. I mean, we had Christine Bell of the Sun, who basically lied in her question to try and make it a bit more important. Uh, she said that routine testing in football clubs had picked up a cluster. And it hadn't. What happened was it picked up seven cases at St Mirren that turned out to be six false positives by a dodgy firm that the SFA had advised St Mirren to use. So one case that they did pick up ain't a cluster. Neither's the case at Aberdeen. So thanks, Christine, for being a liar. You've just confirmed what anybody who doesn't buy the sun in Scotland thinks about your newspaper. This was in the context of should there be... Should Mandatory there be testing, testing in hospitals. Uh, sorry, schools. schools. Right. Which, yeah. I don't know who's asking for that. I don't think I've heard any pol any part political party asking for that. So I don't know why the Sun are pushing that line. Because uh, why are we going to use our testing resources in schools where it's very unlikely that you'll get many school children testing positive? Jimmy, what they're asking for it for is for the headline two months down the line when three people at Pori High School test positive, they can go, you were questioned about this on the 28th of July, and you did nothing about it. I well, think it's a mate. They never look two months in front of their no. nose. They look at two hooters in front of their nose and they're doing something. Oh, no. it, was a, it was a kind of like, uh, it's a catch-all question that they've been asking ever since the start of the coronavirus. Why isn't everybody getting tested? Uh, mm -hmm. I've, I've never seen that question answered. Well, particularly satisfactorily by anyone, apart from the fact that it must be just, anyway, it, it can't be done as far as I too can see. A, too big a job to go and do it, aye. It just well, can't be done. It, it, and the, but the Deputy First Minister, give me his right name, John Swinney, he pops up and says, look, we're using test and protect everywhere, including with schools, and on top of that, we're using aye. surveillance testing, which will cover any unusual Things. Aye, aye, the, the surveillance testing, I think, is a great idea. It's just we random tests all over the country. It's going to be a large number of tests, but what it will do is probably flag up, or hopefully flag up, anything that might be untoward in the first few weeks of kids going back to school. Well, that, I mean, it's maybe worth explaining what it actually involves. It actually involves people who are getting blood tests for other things within the NHS in Scotland. Those blood tests have the coronavirus test added. So they're not going out saying to people, oh, geez, your blood, we want a coronavirus test it. They're right. taking the random sample of people that go to their GP and end up with a blood test. Well, look, here's a good That's question. how they do it. Yeah, but here's a good question. If they are actually specifically targeting somewhere, like schools, are they asking volunteers to come forward for, to, to give blood tests in addition to the normal stuff? They're no, they'll not be. They'll not be specifically targeting schools, mate. From, from uh, any school, for example, see the local school here in the corner. There'll be, in any week, there'd probably be half a dozen teachers and maybe a hundred pupils that get a blood test, as in their normal, daily life. Those tests will be flagged up for the first few, two or three weeks, I'd imagine. I don't school think people or school teachers. It wouldn't even need to be that many. No, it won't be anything like that. I mean, it'll be thousands over Scotland, but it won't be. I mean, I, the other thing that jumped into my head yesterday about testing was this idea 
that's been flagged up by the airlines. They want permission to test people getting off airplanes because they don't understand how it works. What they want to be able to do is say to people, get off the airplane, we'll test you if you're negative, you don't have to isolate. Yeah. Because they don't understand there is no test that predicts you're going to get coronavirus. And until you actually have antibodies, you have to isolate. And it, it just really, really annoyed me that this was taken seriously by um, the, the news broadcasters who should know by now well, you would you, hope that. it's no indicator that you're free of coronavirus because you test negative on Monday. That's, you know? It's been a, it's been uh, a highlight. Oh, sorry, it's not been a highlight, but it's been noticeable just how few reporters, and I, I include TV reporters in this as well as the Deadwood Press, how many of them can sit and watch or listen to daily briefing after daily briefing report on stuff and they don't take in the information themselves. They don't understand what they're reporting on. Yeah, well, we've said this for quite a long time. Let's be honest, not, not one of these, this band of brothers or sisters as well, of uh, Scottish journalists that turn up for these uh, press briefings. At the beginning of this virus pandemic, knew any more about it than the three of us. And we have been studying this every day since. So we but I, I'm, I don't agree with Jimmy on this. I don't think it's ignorance. I think they know. And they simply ignore the facts in order to generate headlines. How much time have they got to go and study it? I mean, they've got... Well, you could be right. well how can they possibly not know? Well, they get paid... I mean, I'm saying of... nothing that hasn't been reported. They've got I, a... I mean, we you had that guy at the at the end of the con press conference, mate. What was his name? Alistair Grant of the Herald. And he was asking Nicky Sturgeon to publish the data that led to Spain going back onto the list of countries that you're quarantined if you come home from. Now, I knew that the Scottish government cannot publish that data because they don't own the data. It's UK government owned, and the UK government are the people that decide whether or not it's published. It's a if joint I know that, he should know that, and if he doesn't know it, he's a clown. And if he does know it, and he's spinning that just to get a question that he could shoehorn Willie Rennie's wee mouthpiece piece this morning into, <laughs> pretty bad behaviour for somebody from. I'm sorry, the Herald used to be a paper that I kind of respected. It's gone so far downhill. I wouldn't have cleaned my shoes with it these days. It's been a long time. It, it, it's a joint biosecurity centre. Yes, I mean, if you, it, 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 it's in the name. Um, Oh, I forgot where I wanted to go. Oh, can so, I, I mean, that, that is another point. Not only do the press ignore the facts in order to generate headlines, the opposition at Holyrood ignore the facts in order to generate headlines, mm. which is exactly what Willie Rennie's done. I mean, he must know who owns right, the Rennie data. Rennie must know. And if he was, doesn't know, he shouldn't be leading the Liberal Democratic uh, Democrats. Probably spent the last fortnight on a beach in Spain and still stuck there. Uh, the, 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 the guy from the Express, he's my favourite hyena, Tom Martin, with a wonderful Middlesbrough accent. I think I can tell the difference between a Geordie and a, a Borough one, I'm not sure. Uh, and he was asking about this complicated thing. Apparently, there are some, there's somewhere in the world that you don't have to do 14 days quarantine because they can test you after 10 days or 8 days or something, and if you're still clear after two days you, you don't you can go back to work you know? test you after eight and then you wait another two i mean all right wonderful uh, does uh, that not suggest that testing you after eight days doesn't give you a definite answer kind of does doesn't it <laughs> well he he goes in the same bracket as christine christine lavelle and alistair grant so we're talking here the mail the sun mm -hmm. and the herald uh, and the express tom martin as well oh the mail fellow yes Aye, uh, well, I'd, I've already seen a tweet for um, Michael Blackley. This is That's him. Where he's, uh, he's gone on about what an interesting answer Nicola Sturgeon gave. And I responded to his tweet by, it's not really interesting, mate. It's what epidemiologists the world over have been saying for months. What did she actually say, Jimmy? That, this, that there could be a resurgence, there could be a yeah. second wave, and we need to prepare for that. No, How on earth? 
he hasn't picked up on that. And I she's been saying it for weeks. Aye, well, exactly. exactly. And, 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 that, and my point is, is, and she said it as well, there's a big difference between a resurgence and a second wave. Right <clears> now there's a resurgence in Australia. Everybody in the Northern Hemisphere is expecting a second wave in the winter. Aye, and we need to, we need to be um, sit up and take notice of what she said today. We have to accept the fact that the country's worked hard, the government's worked hard, everybody in the NHS has worked hard, but we can still blow that if we don't follow the guidelines that are set out there. There's a reason that these guidelines are there. You know, she was having a wee a veiled swipe at some of the pubs that aren't taking contact details or they're not cleaning their tables. If, if pubs are acting in that manner, I'd say shut them. I'd say remove their licence because... If they've been shut for so long and they are not willing to jump through a few hoops that the government are asking for them to jump through, Barry, pull the licence and just put their business doing the tubes all together. I feel, like, I feel like blaming the, the media, the, the UK media and, of course, Boris Johnson's government because they're so bloody complacent. And they talk about, uh, the, the, they use language at the moment that uh, the virus, it's almost like saying the virus is over. And a lot yeah. of people who don't follow the news really believe that the, that the peak's over and, okay, why can't we just behave as normal? Because they yeah, don't understand it's... what a virus is. And that is, you're right, Stuart, there should be headlines. I think, it, well, I, I, I think it's deliberate. Warning about I, the I, dangers. I look at, I look at what the, the, the Westminster Parliament, how the Westminster politicians act, and I think it's deliberate. I think that they didn't want, they certainly don't want um, now to have to work towards a strategy of elimination, even though that looks like it has worked in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. Northern because Ireland's that would, doing fantastic. That, that, would, that would be a massive climb down for them and they'd also have to admit that Westminster doesn't always get everything right. I think the, the, the messaging where they deliberately confuse people I think that's absolutely deliberate because they don't want unity of purpose in this country. Any kind of unity of purpose is anathema to a government that follows the guidelines and, and Steve Bannon's way of operating. Uh, they want to dictate. Stuart said in the, well, as Stuart said in the past, every mixed message that they put out there, it's to bring about chaos, it's to bring about confusion. Because when there is unity of purpose, particularly in this country, We've seen unity of purpose a few times, and the government's had to U-turn. They've yeah. U-turned on uh, face masks. They've U-turned on school dinners down there. They've U-turned on the schools going back on June the 1st. Every time there's been unity of purpose, this government has had to do a U-turn. So the last thing they want is to actually have to do what the other three big parts of the UK have done no, but yeah, but I, and work I, towards I, elimination. Jim, I, I, I just used to, I'd like to bring in the word sensible. They just don't want to go for the sensible option. And so mm. to some extent, you've got to believe what you're saying. What about this Glasgow taxi driver, Jimmy? Oh, Denny, I was raging, mate. I'm, I'm already quite ticked off at seeing all these clowns in Spain who are whinging about having to um, quarantine when they come back. But when it comes to this Glasgow taxi driver that he was talking about, Oh, wait a minute here. I'm going to lose two weeks' money when I get back. Well, came what, mate? You took a punt. You took a punt and got yourself a cheap holiday in Spain when Nicola Sturgeon specifically said that things could change. Absolutely. And your punts, your punts no work too. You went to the bookies, put 50 quid in a horse, and now you're asking the government to give you your 50 quid back. It's ludicrous. And frankly... Like you said off here, Stuart, I have no idea how Nicola Sturgeon manages not to use the word mugs with some of these people. I know it's not very politic, but that's what they are. They've taken a gamble and it's I, no work for them. Jimmy, I was tempted to, 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 to print the word mug on my forehead. It's my favourite movie. <laughs> has is all about that. Um, I can't remember the name of it now, but it's a gangster movie in London. Uh, and having mug on it would remind these idiots if you, you're right, take a punt, go on holiday, why not? But you're going to get stuck there. It's your own fault. Stop well, I, I, I find it interesting that at no point can I remember any government minister giving that warning that things could change. And if you're in Spain and they change, you might be asked to quarantine. I heard the first, minister, 
I had the first Minister. I'm talking Spain. about I'm Aye. talking about Westminster. Whereas yeah, I distinctly remember Nicola Sturgeon saying, "Oh, she said it over and over before she opened up." Uh, well, put Spain on the green list, and when she put Spain on the green list, mm -hmm. so here they've go, they've no she, comeback. No, here she goes. She says today, "I would not book a holiday abroad. I would not go away. Be very, very cautious." Right. I mean, well, the Sun's yeah. headline when it was announced was. Sturgeon U-turn on Spain, which is, Aye. you know, what -turn? well, they've exactly. Got, I mean, that, but I mean, they're quite prepared to lie in a headline. They've got some cheek, um, the current, mm -hmm. given, given that, um, I'm sorry, I, I listed a couple there and then it just occurred to me, the biggest U-turn of all time, perhaps, the NHS app. Let's spend 11.8 million on an app that doesn't work all together. All together let's lie about Apple. Let's lie about um, Google. Google, and at the same time, I'm pretty sure I read I think a couple of days ago that Northern Ireland's app, which has cost less than three quarters of a mil, is now up and running, and it works perfectly well with the different app from the Republic across the border. They <laughs> sync together perfectly, and they've spent less than three quarters of a mil doing it. So um, all the burling that Boris has done on things like that. Excellent. Um, okay, guys, the presser generated quite a lot of comment oh, from us today. Right, Sorry, one, Stuart. One, one piece of news, because it, it could affect quite a lot of our listeners. Apparently, the NHS of Scotland have launched a new service, the NHS Pharmacy First. Mm. Uh, apparently, I've never didn't know that. Well, the, the, up to now, there's been something called a minor ailments clinic. You could go into some community. Yep. What, is, what is a community pharmacy as opposed to a, an ordinary pharmacy? It, it a has a minor, a minor ailments clinic. How do you know? <laughs> anyway, they've announced a, 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 a new service, and it's uh, up to now, these minor ailments clinics were only available to certain categories of people. Now it's available to everybody. I first came across this, I went in to fill a prescription directly from the doctors as a pharmacy, the other side of the links. And they had this frosted box, frosted glass box in the corner. Ooh. And this was an examination room. Oh yeah, they got that, most pharmacies. Um, which rather took me aback. Um, but that is apparently what your community pharma pharmacist can do for you. Uh, they too can prod and poke you. To be honest, mate, that I think it's it's not a bad thing. It's um, it's one of these things where we've always said that there's too much pressure on GPs, and we all know it's it's like them finally biting the bullet and um, letting senior nurses prescribe drugs rather than only doctors could do it a few years back. I mean, exactly. And it just takes pressure off. I mean, it, it takes you three years to get a degree and then a bit of training before you can become a nurse. That surely that's enough qualification to let you know whether you can get prescribed drugs. Well, I mean, to some level. But um, I was going to say, guys, interestingly, as you two know, the listeners don't, I've recently had quite a serious diagnosis. But every element of the team that I'm involved with uh, is offering audio, video, texting, um, phone calls, Everything you, every way you could think of communi of communicating, is yeah. available. I've really been impressed. So, mm -hmm. if you don't need to actually be there um, to have your temperature taken, um, you have numerous options now. Aye, and I think that's I think that's a good thing as well, mate. You, I don't know what surgery you're in, but I'm in the one that was Leith Walk that's now in the old um, Central Station in Leith, Aye. and it's it's all fairly modern in there and i've spoke to them a couple of times lately and they have found um for example video conferencing no video conferencing video appointments have been hugely popular both with the doctors and with patients because a lot of the time you're right the doctor doesn't need to physically see you they can yeah. speak to you and they can see you look well blah 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 pop in or they can say, go and see the pharmacist and get this the prescription sitting there waiting for you. And yeah. it's a great, it's one of the great leaps forward, I think. I mean, clearly, the amount of deaths we've seen through COVID has been a disaster. But there have been certain leaps forward as well. So, 
Well, oh, the, yeah. the other thing, the my, the my GP was telling me that it's great because if somebody doesn't turn up for an appointment, because what they don't do is say, we'll phone you at 11 o'clock. Mm. You know, they phone you when they're free to phone you. Oh. Um, they give you a window, but it's not like an appointment, 11 o'clock appointment. But he, she was saying rather that if there's a missed appointment, she uses that for her phone calls. So the time isn't totally wasted. So oh, I have face-to-face appointment. Somebody doesn't turn up for a face-to-face. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, that's fair enough. Aye. Hugely well, suppose, forward in efficiency. I yeah. we should say, we should mention, mention that the Louisa Jordan Emergency Hospital at the SECC, just in case this could become a, a hot topic in the future for the likes of the sun, um, because they like to say, oh, well, it wasn't used. Yeah, right. Uh, they've now got to the stage where they're using it as a pilot project, they call it. They're doing orthopedics, plastic surgery, x-rays, scans, and dermatology there. Uh, it's already been piloted, so it is open. Aye. And they're, I think they've seen 300 patients, and they're going to up it. Um, I mean, over in Australia this week, they've announced they've, had, they've, moved, let's, they've moved experts from the health service into care homes. They've, they've cleared elective surgery i mean they're that no they're, they're in that the, this is a resurgence in australia at least we've got a hospital ready well I, this that's probably a good point to bring up now that you mentioned care homes and um, the bbc are going to be doing let me guess a hatchet job on the scottish government tonight yes on dispatches uh, disclosure disclosure BBC scotland and disclosure it's um, not like the track record. They've been absolute lying bobags, the BBC Disclosure team, but they have got a track record. They've been absolute lying bobags. So I'm kind of looking forward to picking well, this I would, re- job apart tomorrow. I would recommend anybody who is going to watch it to go to the Talking Up Scotland uh, mm-hmm. website. Um, they've, they've got a nice little piece that yeah. explains, shall we say, the limited nature of the inquiries made. Yes. I actually, did you? Uh, there's a good question for both of you. I recognise two of the three people, apparently, that are, are uh, whose families are involved. They've been asked, and two of them are famous. One of them is a football pundit, comedian. I didn't recognise any of them. Mate. Uh, anyway, two of the three are, are famous personalities off the TV. So I just wondered if you'd any of you recognised all three. Well, I have to say that as somebody who's both of whose parents have been in care homes, COVID-19 didn't affect them. They died before it happened. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, all oh, right, okay, I'd forgotten you were famous. Aye, well, it's, it's interesting that they've, um, it'll be interesting to watch, put it that way, because as I say, BBC Disclosure team have a, they, they tend to work towards their own narrative. It's been they, shown in the yeah. past that they decide what the story is and then go out and find evidence to make the bones of that story yeah. rather than actually going and investigating and coming up with a story. Well, one, of the, one, of the aspect, one of the reasons I uh, put uh, this up, unfortunately, the Australia figures on social media at, uh, today was that um, the way they are handling, this is now, bear in mind how long it, uh, this is now, when did this virus start? Hitting us all, March. March. Right. Only now they are saying they are actually moving in profession, pro- professionals in it. Well, their equivalent of NHS people into what they call aged care in a, in a, in Melbourne, because the staff in these privately owned care homes can't care. Now, that could develop into a, a very interesting story. We, I, I will give you my usual disclaimer on this we need to be very careful people have this view that a care home is a hospital environment it is not it's a lot more difficult to isolate in a care home and i'm not a big fan of private care homes but this is a different kind of building to a hospital it's too many people have it in their head that they should be able to do everything you can do in a hospital Quite apart from anything else, they're carpeted. Mm-hmm. Well, look at, there are two ways to look at what they're doing in Australia and Melbourne at the moment. One, what the first option is, they got it very wrong at the start, and they haven't been taking any notice of what happened in other countries abroad. 
or it is still a very difficult uh, area to, to deal with as far as this virus is concerned. It's still a, it's, it's still a very virulent virus. If it gets mm. into a bloody care home, it's going to rattle through it. And frankly, it's getting in worldwide through staff. Yeah, I think that's where it is, to be honest. Well, um, we, we wait for proof, which will get... If, if the government can't be blamed in any way whatsoever, um, we'll get that proof in about three months. If it can be blamed in any way whatsoever, 30 years. <laughs> oh, you old cynic, Nori. Um, okay, let's, let's move on. Mm -hmm. Craig Murray published a letter today. Stuart, yeah. this is your subject. Well, there's so many aspects of what's been happening to Craig Murray. Craig Murray published a letter today, uh, which he's published, which he, sorry, which he sent to Ian McCann, who is a senior officer at the SNP. And he's requesting uh, that he be put through the vetting procedure as a ca potential candidate for an SNP role in uh, the upcoming election next year. Now, the reason he's written this letter is not a straightforward uh, letter. Uh, Ian McCann is an official who uh, he has admitted that he said he received a complaint about sexual uh, harassment about Alex Salmond and simply put it on file so he could use it later. I'll leave it as bland as that. So he's rather opened up a whole can of worms, as they say at the moment. Well... So I'll let you go. Sorry, Nori. I don't think that um, Craig Murray seriously thinks he'll be on any candidates list for the no, SNP. No, no, I know. I don't think anybody does. He's already been rejected as a candidate. Now, I don't know. I think it was the 2015 general election. Um, he went through the process and was not considered. I was told that he was not considered suitable because he was a loose cannon. In other words, he had principles that he was not prepared to put to one side to toe the party line. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that would surprise any of us to learn if that, that was true. Um, I certainly, if I ran a political party, Craig Murray would not be standing as an MP or an MSP for my political party. Oh, he's yeah. a loose cannon, but it, it's, uh, I think it's, he, he is, let's put it this way, he's friends with John Pilger, he's friends with Julian Assange, um, he's friends with Alex Salmond. Um, he uh, definitely comes from the sort of, uh, that particular side of... Now he's an ex-diplomat who was a whistleblower. He outed the British government for turning a blind eye. In fact, more than that, for assisting in torture in Azerbaijan, was it? Uzbekistan. But Uzbekistan. Yeah. At the time of the, what was it, the render, rendition flights were going on during that period. And the because IA the British was... government used information that was obtained by torture. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, so be blunt. If you ran a political party, do you want this guy in your ranks? He's also had a go... Greatest respect for him, but as I say... He's also had a go today at Hamza Youssef uh, and Hamza's new hate crime bill that's still... Is, is the consultation period up or is that in, in August? Jimmy? I, th I think it might just have... It might just be about finished, I think. I think it finishes at the end of this month, actually, the consultation. So at that point... Um, I'm assuming that the whole thing's going to need rewritten because the Law Society's submission to them basically told them that it was unworkable in its present form. So mm -hmm. unless they're going to ignore the Law Society and ignore the faculty advocates, then... And the police and don't and like the feel of it because they feel they're going to be asked to, to decide right, so what Scottish isn't, isn't right. freedom of speech. Scottish Police Federation don't like it at all. And, I mean, look, they've got, unfortunately, SNP have got form. There's a good expression you don't hear every day anymore. When it comes to um, the, the offences, you get me, you'll get me, correct me, Jimmy, won't you? The offences at football, 
Uh, the f- offensive behaviour at football, the, the, the reality is it's not the SNP that have got form for that one, it's the rest of the Parliament and the Greens in particular. The Offensive Behaviour at Football Act was working relatively well. The only people who were really offended by the operation of that act were people who were committing offences in football grounds. But James Kelly being an enthrall to a particular element of a particular football club support in Glasgow. Is that the Green Brigade? No, you're not allowed to mention Ah, yes. He, re- he led a campaign against it. So, and the Greens, for some strange reason, Paddy Harvey decided to jump on this one because he thought that football hooligans had a right not to be filmed when they were committing acts of hooliganism. The, the Green decision on this one was political. And I mean, purely political. It was the only opening they could see to give the SNP a bloody nose, which was their warning that they were wanting something come the budget. Well, I bet what's, what's happened because of that has led to, you'll forgive me, but loyalist gangs roaming the streets and shouting and swearing at refugees the other week because those folk were football supporters from Rangers. And they would not have ganged together and felt free to march down the street if the OFBA was still in place because they all would have been filmed last season. And as they got together on the streets this year, the Polish could have went in and said, listen, we've got records of you doing this and that. Disperse, go home, or you're getting lifted. Fair enough. Um... We were talking about Craig Murray. Aye. Yes, he's, um, uh, interestingly, he's uh, apparently, I mean, God, is he's an interesting man. He's now going to spill. He, he was in as a reporter at the last Assange trial, which was an ongoing situation for Julian Assange. He was there. Um, I think he was thrown out of that towards the end of it. I think he was also thrown out of the Salmon trial, which he was there as a reporter for. Now he's, he said he's possibly going to Spain as a witness because a, co- a, a company that, uh, a contractor company that uh, did work for the CIA was bugging Julian Assange in the Ecuador embassy and there's some court case, court case going on in Madrid. My God, he gets about. Why Madrid? It's a Spanish company run by an American, owned by an American that's got, who's got a contract with the CIA. <laughs> um, is that enough? Has he got yeah. it written on the visible ink? Um, he was thrown out of the Salmon trial because of the court case that he's now involved in uh, for disclosing jigsaw Yeah, games. I keep meaning to go back and have a look at that. That was actually what they're trying to do him under was the, um, the piece that he wrote as a dream. You remember the, the <sighs> satirical piece? where they're saying that in in what was a piece of satire, I remember reading it, but I'll have to go back and look closer, that he's somehow identified, I think it's maybe two of these alphabet women, but well, it, did, does seem, it does seem stuff and nonsense, that one. But you're right, Norrie, he wouldn't be anywhere near my political party either, because not only is he a loose cannon, but he seems to have, he seems to have developed... He's too principled. No, but he, he seems to have developed a mad habit for self-publicity self-publicising at the most inopportune times when maybe wow. he could just keep his mouth shut and concentrate on winning this court case first. I'd actually like to go to the pub, because it could happen here in Edinburgh all at the same time. I'd like to go to the pub with Craig Murray, Stuart Campbell and uh, Mark Hurst as well. From I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go to the pub with Stuart Campbell. I'd bounce him up and do the street first. With, with um, Mark Hurst as well from Sputnik. Uh, I'd love to get, I'd like to find out what they were doing. I mean, Stu, it, Stu Campbell's back on form, published yesterday and today. Oh, it was great today, wasn't he? <laughs> um, a good piece yesterday as well, because uh, he's been chasing the, uh, the Law Society and the, uh, what do you call it? Aye, Crown Top Office. Light. Aye, Crown Office, to get some answers about um, the Craig Murray court case, really, about why Craig Murray's up and nobody else is. It was interesting to read, actually, that part of the remit for taking somebody up to court is the public good. Public interest. 
Well, it's always been the case. They, they always say that, that the, the prosecution will always say, is it in the public interest to carry on with this case? Aye, because it's, it's clearly not in the public interest for somebody in a senior, level, senior position in the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service to take his wife to court. But it might be in the public interest to take Craig Murray to court. That is kind of really what I was saying. I mean, that is a right. huge get-out clause. It's that a, is a massive so get out, open right. to abuse. Open to interpretation. They can oh. basically, basically uh, the Lord Advocate and all of those in and around the Procurator Fiscal's office can do what they want when you've got a, a get-out oh, clause that big. In effect, it's a let's protect the elite clause. Mm. It's like I, you were saying yesterday, not, Nori, about... Um, the, the Justice Minister recusing himself and the Lord Advocate recusing himself. And at that point, neither of them actually have to stipulate who is going to fulfill the role that they have recused themselves from. That's another massive get-out clause for the elite. Aye, it's well, quite scary. It's very, true. very interesting point. No, Jimmy, I think it's just what you said, what Jimmy just said. I hadn't thought of that. It's a clearly very well put. Well, it's just... It, it just I think we've all, as political geeks, we've always, always known that the the system is weighted in favour of certain members of certain senior members of society. But this just points it out to you and underlines it in a wee green pen a wee bit. Um, anything else on Craig Murray? He'll be back. <laughs> I I don't I think Craig Murray is if. You know, if there was a second chamber at Holyrood, Craig Murray is one of the guys I'd like to see sitting in there. Aye. Um, Aye, he's, 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 he's got great experience. He's got a good mind. I just, yeah, I do think that, I, to be honest, mate, I worry for him because I think he's, I think the pressure's probably pretty strong at the moment. And it looks very much like Chamber Street and people that work in that big office in Chamber Street They've painted a target on his back, mate, and it could very well be that if you want to go for conspiracy theories, it could very well be they're doing a favour for somebody in the US Embassy or the US Consulate in Regent Terrace. I think you're I think they're going to nail very, into the top, mate. No, very well, very carefully put there, Jimmy. I well, I think I think he might end up suffering from the tag eccentric. Um, I think could, could I think the way they'll that. deal with him is by trying to to, to make people think he shouldn't be taken right. seriously. Frame him as a loony tune. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, one thing I'd like to bring up, that just popped back into my head, is Boris Johnson's idea of bringing his cabinet up to the new Crown offices in New Street in Edinburgh. Mm -mm. Um, quite a narrow street, should be quite easy to block. I don't think you'll need more than 500 demonstrators to well, that, that, that would be easy to, to manage I, I'd, ima I'd imagine they'd have to do it possibly at about two o'clock one tuesday morning when most people are lying sleeping and snoozing because if they do it at any point if if the information got out that the cabinet were going to meet in edinburgh they'd be surrounded mate they would be surrounded by thousands of people chanting some very i would imagine it wouldn't be very um, complimentary to Boris and his sidekick. I think it would be a four-letter word beginning with S and C. Mm. Well, do you know what I was thinking? It was a really stupid place to build it. Because <laughs> you, well, you only need three barricades, two small ones and one big one in Market Street. Mind you, they could, they could walk from the station. If they come by train, they could walk from the station just like all those Labour MPs during the referendum. And they've, you, still, they've still got only one way out. And you could play that one of that car park. That you Aye, it's, it's, it, you're right, mate. You're right. It's a, it is a silly place to build it. But then there weren't that many large sites in central Edinburgh. That am I, that am I right in saying to me that the entrance is facing Market Street? I, I've actually not seen, I've not been up that way for a while, mate. So I've not seen the new Scottish office. Um, I don't know exactly where about on that site it is, but you're right. You block oh. Colton. You block Colton Road. You block New Street. You block Market Street. They're stuck in there. There's nowhere just block for them New to go. Street. Why stop people driving into the back of the station? Nah, just block New Street and Market Street in the top. Because there's other ways out at that point, mate. You'd have to shut. You'd have to shut Colton Road, and you'd have to shut Market Street. Right. Look, now, Dory, have you got that? Have you got that um, little clip handy for the? But you could. The Empire Strikes Back. Mm -hmm. 
You could surround the building I easily. Probably enough, have mate. somewhere. You, you, surround the building pretty easily with a few thousand bodies. Uh, you, were and, gonna, you were going to use it the other week, but I don't know why it never uh, got used. I have geezer sack. Ah, Denny geezer sack. It, it, Another thing. It, it's all over the place. So, do we think that uh, Boris bringing the cabinet to Scotland? They're talking about full cabinet, mm. or Mr. Gobe's overseeing cabinet, which is going to tell the Scottish Parliament what it is and isn't allowed to do. Is Michael Gove here today? Yes, no, he was here. Yes, he was here yesterday. Okay. Which okay. is a point I didn't bring up about the presser. There were no politically slanted questions at the presser today. No yeah. Russian report questions or whatever. Do you think Nicholas Pressman has actually gone round them all and slapped their wrists? <laughs> I, I'm not so sure, mate. I think Jackson Carlo just phoned the Express and phoned the Telegraph and that says, go on, you know, be political this for the next couple of weeks because you've been doing it for us for the last couple of weeks and it hasn't worked. <laughs> has in fact and, backfired. And the other thing, I would love to have seen Jackson Carlo's blood pressure about half past one because all he's whining about Nicola Sturgeon um, getting an hour on the telly every day for a party political broadcast. Well, she got an hour and 15 minutes a day, Jackson. <laughs> so I hope, I hope your head's blown off your big fat ball bag. <laughs> Jimmy, could you just try to say what you mean? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, Stuart, anything? more today? Aye, well, we've got the usual news that the BBC have managed to clear Sarah Smith. <laughs> Apparently, she, if you recall, that she um, did a very nasty piece of uh, reporting about the First Minister who claimed that, she, that the First Minister enjoys uh, ploughing a different path from London when it comes to handling this uh, mm. pandemic. And uh, the, the, the BBC did a usual whitewash. She said, oh, no, no bother. Aye. Sarah's a lovely lassie. She didn't really mean to say that the First Minister was enjoying wallowing in other people's misery. So what did the BBC say? Did they just kind of go, ah, well, she didn't mean it? Or, oh, uh, apparently she apologised afterwards. Oh, that's all right. Okay. It was a mistake in her choice of wording and the fact that she apologised afterwards means that it's all white water under the bridge and we have to ignore it. It certainly doesn't in any way show bias from Sarah Smith. There was, uh, there's been quite a bit about BBC bias floating about Twitter this morning. Mm, I'm not um, surprised, mate. As we, as we see with that disclosure thing, they've got a track record. Um, BBC Scotland as a whole, they, they don't like to be shown up, but let's be honest. It's that. People it's a pound shop dispatches. You know, they don't have, well, maybe they do have the talent, it's just not being used, but they don't seem to have the budget to go out and do a real in-depth inquiry. No, it's, I mean, it's it always this surface stuff coming to the obvious conclusions, you know? Well, well you're talking about tonight's disclosure. Yeah. Mm. Well, as far as I know, uh, there are three anecdotal reports, and that's it. Well, there's the three people that to whom you recognised, who, who, who I presume have family in care homes, but they've only looked at private care homes. Aye. They haven't looked and, at council care homes. And let's be honest, they'll, 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 be, they'll be speaking to that clown in the multicoloured specs who think he's Christopher Biggins, and that boy that runs Renaissance Care. Aye. Aye. He, he, oh, no doubt. He's, he was never off the BBC and STV, actually. He's, it seems that um, chucking some money at a particular political party gets you pretty good access to our Ooh. national broadcasters. Well, he was a get your retaliation in first guy, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. was oh, absolutely. Partly the uh, Hugh Pennington is in uh, on this show. Oh, again. Jesus. I mean, so he is a, a paid up member of the Green Ink Brigade. He is an extremist. He's an extremist. I'll tell you, I'll tell you something, Stuart. He's an extreme as Hezbollah. See, see the Nicky see the Nicky empty. I mean, seriously, he, he looks unwell. I think they're putting a lot of pressure on him to keep turning up to do these TV programmes. He looks like he's got I've, one foot I've in the got, coffin. I'm sorry to inform you guys. I watched him on a programme um, that didn't mention Scotland. It had nothing to do with Scottish independence. And the guy came across as very good. It was on his subject. It was about biological threats. Um, 
but you know, I mean, he we all think of him as a raging clanking idiot, but right. you know, well, a unionist a extremist. Idiot, but he is an ex- he is a unionist extremist, and he should never be allowed near any program that has anything to do with the Scottish government. Well, exactly. Do you see Tommy Sheridan on the BBC? No. So why is Hugh Pennington on the BBC? Because Hugh Pennington does have some sort of degree in areas of interest. And he's not a convicted liar. And makes himself available. Okay, I'll think of somebody else. By the way, there's another clown just managed to make the papers today. George Fuchs. Ah, my mate George. Mm. Apparently, he doesn't like Richard Leonard and he he wants him to go. Do you thing. know? Do you know when you told me that? I was at the, my first thought was: Is George Fuchs looking to angle himself into the leader of the Labour Party in Scotland? He's he's maybe just trying to keep it. I think there's a bet on. I think him and George Galloway have got a bet on who of them can get the most column inches before, say, the end of July or something. Because I've never known Fuchs to appear so often lately in the Scottish news. I've t- We've talked about this before, guys, I know, but I just cannot see anybody in the Labour Party at Holyrood that, that's a leader. No, there's no me. As I say, they, they, they're looking at Jackie Bailey, Barry. She's a dumbass. Then you're looking at Monica Lennon, who she's got more baggage than my taxi when I go down at the Waverley Station to take four folk on holiday. Um, Will they really put another English person in the leadership position. Jackie Bailey's no English, mate. She's Scottish. Is she? Just Aye, she's, just got, she, she's just got that accent because she was educated um, abroad, mate. She went to the international school when she was younger. Don't you mm. recognise the accent? She sounds like our friend that works with the Scottish Qualifications Authority. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, I suppose she does, eh? Mm. I, I actually thought she was English. But I think oh, she's, a, English. she's a shoe-in for it once Labour get trounced in the election next year, which is remarkable given how poor she is and she's done the job in the past as a caretaker, but there we go. Well, but you're right, I, then you're looking at what, Jenny Mara, somebody like well, that. that. That's actually a huge presumption. Is she going to get back into Holyrood? She um, hasn't got me, that big a majority, has she? No, she's no, she's got a pretty small majority, but I think it's absolute certainty that she'll be top of the list in whatever area mm. she's standing. Just true, to make sure. True. Mm, never thought of that. Keep and just, bef- just before we go, talking to people that are top of the list, our um, chief goat botherer and um, apron wearer, Murdo Fraser, he kind of scunnered me this morning because it takes a lot to disgust me at the actions of a Scottish Tory. But there you go, Murdo retweeted a story about a boy who'd got his cell locked up last week in, in uh, Perth Crown Court for... Um, being a JK and having violent episodes. But Murdo retweeted it with the simple words, oh, because the last time the boy was in court, he said that um, minimum alcohol pricing had saved his life and stopped him being a violent alcoholic. So there was Murdo watching a guy get sent down and trying to score cheap political points on it. And as I say, it takes a lot to show me about the Scottish stories, but Murdo Fraser, lower than a snake's belly. I am a surprise. I, I really, this is where we need journalism to nail these guys. Aye. To actually turn around, not even over that story, simply to say to them, what has proven to be successful in other countries, minimum pricing of alcohol, why won't it succeed in Scotland? And the next question oh. has to be, why don't you want it to succeed in Scotland? I the, the there, questions uh, that I've just never asked, Noddy. It's never it's it's acceptable in this country to oppose just because you want to oppose. You don't have to have a reason to oppose stuff. You don't have to. The only reason that you need to attack and that the press will not question you on is that you're anti SNP. It's it's becoming the great thing about the daily pressers. Mm-hmm. You just listen right. to the way the questions are put and look at the headlines the next day. And you know exactly what the game is. Stuart's waving his finger round and round and round. I think that means wind it up. <laughs> I, think, I think it does. Or he's just trying to wind me up. Possibly. 
Okay, Stuart, we'll finish then. Uh, thank you, guys. Stuart Lockhead, uh, Jimmy Hutton. I'm Norrie Stewart. We'll bye catch bye. up with everybody tomorrow. Um, what's tomorrow? PMQs? No, they're on holiday. They're on holiday, mate. We've so got, no, we've got Parliament on Thursday. Uh, no, we've got to, the, we'll, Holyrood. Twelve fifteen tomorrow for the uh, press. And then Thursday we've got a presentation. Statement. Yeah. Uh, statement. Okay. Aye, right, that's the thirtieth. That's the three week look at lockdown, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Once again, folks, thanks for watching and listening, and we'll catch you tomorrow. Cheers for now.